on the front row. For those of you who don't know who I am and why I'm standing up here, I'm Cheryl Hafney. I'm a coastal geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and I'll show up to these seminars now and then. Um, but today, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce you our speaker, uh, Dr. Jesse McNinch. And um, Jesse comes to us from the Field Research Facility. It's part of the U.S. Army Corps <coughs> of Engineers facility in <coughs> Duck, North Carolina. Um, and he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Louisiana Fayetteville and went on to do both a master's and a PhD um, at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Jesse's primary research focus is on the application of observational techniques to understanding coastal processes and coastal change. But he has sort of uh, forayed into a interesting um, new world of looking at sedimentological record and, and trying to understand a little bit about long-term hurricane history from that. And that's what I think he's going to talk about today. Meaning so. I don't know what I'm talking about at all. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. I, you know, there's a universal thing about seminar rooms, and it's always okay. sloping that way. Do you guys feel the gravity? Everyone's packed back there. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. As, as Cheryl said, this is not normally what I do, but I'm really excited to, uh, to present this to you guys, really, as a, a I know there's a, a community of climate-oriented people here, so I'm really excited to get your input. Ridicule and laughter is okay. I'd rather hear it here than when I submit the, uh, the papers. But before I start, I want to tell you a little bit about the organization that I'm a part of. Um, I don't know how broadly we, this is known in the, in the coastal oceanographic, at least the SWASH community, the FRF is a bit of Mecca. I think you have to pass through there at, well, at least one time in your career. But it's out on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. It's uh, been operated since uh, or established in 1977. And the mission really has been to collect long-term oceanographic data. And just really recently has that started to bear fruit in that we're starting to see some climate signals that I talk, I'll talk a little bit about in the future. Uh, part of that, these observations are, are waves. We study waves really, or at least we observe waves, and we have an array that's pretty unmatched, I believe, around the world. Looking for the laser. This array of wave sensors span the surf zone and go offshore. And one of the things that we are fairly keen on doing is, is recording the storm history over the last, well, now we have 35 years or so. You're welcome. And the, um, but the thing that's sort of near and dear to my heart, which is a bit of a segue with what I'm going to talk about, is our morphology data and the, and the, the signals that we see preserved in the geology in, in the sediment of the shoreline and this was supposed to be a movie that runs and shows you the evolution or the profile change through time and really what you're looking at is up here it's steep because of the vertical exaggeration but this is the dune going across the beach into the water which the water surface is about there and then that's a, a near shore bar or surf zone sandbar and as this plays it's it's essentially every survey over the last 35 years and it really is a bit hypnotic, like watching a fire or something. You can watch this bar move back and back and forth, back and forth. And it it's really represents a lot of interesting things. But one thing is just the dedication to be there, to show up you know, every month before or after storms and building that data set. I didn't do hardly any of it, but the group that I'm with have been responsible. And in fact, we just, I, I really want to mention this, we just passed a milestone, the Lark, which is this amphibious vessel you see go in the water. Now it's the primary platform from which we do these profiles across the surf zone. It, we just, the odometer just tripped to 6,000 miles. So we've gone to the west coast and back in the Lark in driving survey lines over the last 35 <laughs> years. So we were high-fiving around the, the FR after that. But I, I presented this because I wanted to tell you a little bit about the FRF and say, too, that we're already seeing some interesting things out of this 35 data set. And many people through the years, Nathaniel Plan is one of them, have looked at some of the morf our morphology data. But um, we're now at, at 35 years. We're cleaning it up. And one thing that already jumps out at us is if you do some very simple harmonic analysis, there's some power that pops out. Again, it's, it's a bit of a challenge because it's infrequent data. It's about monthly but it spans 35 years. Any guess, what do you think is the strongest 
power that we see in terms of change in the morphology. And it doesn't matter. Actually, it shows up either as I track the shoreline or if I track some point off of the bar, not really the bar movement. But changes in this profile, I see a, a strong power at any guesses? What, what time period do you think we'd see a lot of power? Six months. There's a seasonal signal, that's for sure. So that's the winter, summer profile, which is a classic thing in coastal morphology. But there's another one. Any other guesses? Seven years. Yes. <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> now, that surprised me, though. I mean, I, maybe not to you guys that study climate more, but it's weird. A morphology measured on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, sensitive to a strong power in the INSO, you know, this five to ten year time period. Um, so that is something that I'm eager to charge into and to look at, but that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about today is, is this effort of my group to build a 500-year high-resolution hurricane history for the North Atlantic. And, you know, I was speaking to one of my um, older graduate students earlier. Uh, she's not old. We, yeah. Sorry, Jen. Um, <laughs> I really like the fact that I can have a beer while I talk. Anyway. You guys do it right. Um, she said, you're still working on that? And it's true, this has been a labor of love for the last six or seven years at least. And you, I think many of you can relate. I didn't have dedicated funding to do it. Luckily, I don't have progress reports. This has been something that I really wanted to do just because I was fascinated by the question. And uh, it's, it's just been a labor of love. So I'm excited to present this to you and, and get your thoughts on it. But You'll see as I develop this, pro uh, the, the problem is why it's so important to get this, why it's so, so important to obtain this high resolution hurricane history. And I love this saying, I really wanted to start with that, and that is history happens in the first person, but is recorded in the third person. And I like that saying because I think it really condenses what it is, what it is to, to look to be a coastal geologist. Maybe let me simplify it down to that. And, and I love, you know, I, whether it's true or not, I love the idea that we can go to a site and either look at the morphology or maybe the sediment grain, but somehow preserved in that geologic signal, however broadly defined you want to make it, there's a story there. And there's a good record. Now, the challenge, of course, is interpreting it and reading it and knowing what it is. But, uh, but it's real. And... It's, it has, the other thing that got me charged about this project is, you know, you look at disasters like Katrina or the most real recent one in the Philippines, and I think we as a community, and I'll make a big plug at the end, really can go, can make good strides or big strides towards translating what happens in the coastal processes, the sort of coastal, uh, yeah, morphology community, to something that's applicable and useful for predicting hurricanes to the meteorology community. So I'm really talking about connecting climate scale, which <coughs> typically we work on longer time scales because we really don't understand it that well, and the coastal community, which is, you know, we're lucky if we get the next storm or how the beach might erode correctly. And I'm trying to couple the two. So I want to start with this question, and I really do want to see a raise of hands. You have to answer. Have tropical cyclones increased? Raise a hand. Those who believe it's increased over the last century and a half. First, oh man, you guys are coy. Or decrease. Seriously, I, I won't hold you to it. How many think they've increased over the last century? The number of occurrence. There's one. Really? And the rest of you think it's decreased? No change. Uh, bunch of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you typically, you guys are way too smart, but oftentimes when I've given this to like, you know, the Rotary Club kind of thing, they almost always say, definitely increasing. And I really believe it's because of this, that, you know, the Weather Channel and the media, basically. <laughs> because we remember, you know, you remember what happened in the last year, what was reported, and certainly the Weather Channel tunes you in and lets you know how it's all bad. But, you know, as simple of a question as that is, it's a hard one to answer, those of us who actually deal with data. And, and if, I, if I showed you this number, this is, I think, almost everyone could accept it. It's the Her NOAA's HERDAT data set. I'll refer to this throughout the talk, which is basically NOAA's really great effort of combing the record, 
Um, it's certainly the last night since the 1950s, they have satellite data, so no one really challenges that. And then prior to that, it's a bit of a compilation of records and ship logs and things like that. But this is their finding since 1850, which is when it started. And you can see just in this little bar diagram of the decadal, the number of U.S. landfalls. And there, you notice, I, don't, I didn't update this, but if I had 2005 to 2010, the bar would be higher. But you can see there's not a real obvious trend that jumps out at you. Um, and that's really the problem, and that's really the heart, what motivates this work, and what's motivated others to do the similar thing. And that is, there are too few observations of nonlinear or quasi-periodic variables to calibrate and to assess our long-term climate models. Let me put it, that I'm going to put this to you in a couple of ways. How often does the group at, out of Colorado update the hurricane forecast for a given season? Just the number of hurricanes that we might expect. Three, Three times, exactly. You know, gang, that's bad, you know? <laughs> we're in the year, and you get to update it three times, and now we're talking about taking that grand understanding and out, you know, forecasting it out decades to centuries to millennia. Whew, really, that's bad. Um, and and part, of the, part of the reason, or part of the thing that makes it difficult is what I say here, but I think makes maybe a little more sense, or at least it made more sense when I dug this up. This quasi-periodic variables, and really what I mean, this is a, I'm grinning, this is a, a Cheryl, this is a fugue. I had to ask her to look it up and tell me how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Completely musically brain dead. But when I was digging into this, it really did, it made a nice analogy. And really what I'm trying to say is that Hurricanes are a lot like this piece. And as I understand it, a fugue is something that's agonizingly long. <laughs> you have to sit and listen to this. And these different pieces, maybe the flutes or whatever else is in a symphony, they <laughs> come in and out of phase. You know, and you have to listen to the whole thing to hear the pieces come in and out of phase and hear it all building to this point and then it changes. But you can't make a really conclusion on the whole piece until you hear the whole piece. And, and I believe that's really what we're facing with something as complicated as hurricanes. You know, if you had a group of meteorologists in this room, I bet they would agree that maybe there are 12, 15 variables. African dust storms, NAO, ENSO, um, oh, I'm not thinking of them, sea surface temperature. Lots of variables that they all agree is important. But you've got them to wrestle it down to a set of equations where you actually put some coefficients to it, which are most important, which are less important. They wouldn't leave the room in any kind of order. They would be wrestling and fighting the whole time. And the problem is, is that they don't have a long enough record of these different variables coming in and out of phase of one another. And again, to make it even more complicated, they're not even periodic. They're not even repeating. So that's where we as a community, and this is what I'm going to really challenge, if you forget everything, we as a community, what I'd like to see is if we can build that long-term data set of, these, of the hurricanes at a high enough frequency, at the same time some of these climate variables, so that we can start to do a better job of getting the equation right. Yeah. So here's what others have done, and I suspect that I'm forgetting some. Um, I don't want to go through the whole list, but, you know, I'm certainly not the first to try to get a paleo record of hurricanes. What I'm trying to do is come up with a different proxy that gives a little more higher frequency that I'll explain in, in detail. And I know Ilsa and others are involved in doing some of this work. Here's some of the coral work she was just telling me about this morning. But you can see there's a whole list of people that have been striving to try to get this hurricane record. But typically, I think all of us would agree that there's no one perfect magic bullet. Some are better in subannual, they're getting great subannual resolution, but they will go back a shorter period of time. Some can go back thousands of years, but then they typically have a much lower frequency or uh, ability to resolve things. So what inspired me was basically coming up with a new proxy. Let me, let me tell you about this one, because this one was so probably the closest home uh, or made most sense to me as I started this because I know nothing about corals or biology 
or geochemistry. Actually, lots of things, but those in particular, I don't <laughs> very little about. Um, we were at, it was part of the, I was wearing my Corps of Engineers hat, and we were studying run-up in island and reef environments. We know not, some of our run-up equations really haven't been vetted in reef environments. So we were down there, and we had lots of sensors out across some of the islands in the East of Caribbean. And uh, the bottom line is, man, it's complicated. We were doing a very poor job of just getting run-up right. And then, yet, yeah, one of the biggest um, proponents, or not the biggest sources of paleo hurricane record, is this. Uh, well, Paul Liu is one of them, but Jeff Donnelly and Woodruff, and there are many others that have had some nice publications using overwash records to get the, the uh, to get um, hurricane record. And I'm making the connection. Of course, you got to get run up right to get the water high enough up across the dune to then breach the dune and cause overwash. And then you go out with your little coring rig and you drill down into these back barrier or, or you know, marsh sediments behind the barrier island and you look for that lens of sediment that represents the overwash. I love it in the sense that it makes sense. It takes a big storm generally to generate an overwash and you go down and you can see these lens. The lithology is quite different than the surrounding material. So it does work well. The problem is, is that they only resolve about one to as many as three storms per century. So we know that we're not really getting all of them captured with, the, with this approach. And the other problem, and this is not a knock on, the, on this proxy, because the, all the proxies have their pros and cons, but as you guys know, when you start to take these cores back in time, say 1,000 or 2,000 years, well, you know, did the, did the topography that's dictating whether or not something's going to overwash, did that change? Did it get higher or lower? Was it vegetated? Was it not? Was the beach wider? All those things really influence run-up and therefore overwash. Was it a cat five at a low tide or a cat one at a high tide? Lots of things that influence whether or not overwash occurs. So I was inspired, particularly when I was sitting there literally at a bar in Antigua realizing how complicated the run-up story was. It's like, man, we really need another proxy to understand or to, to try to attack this hurricane record. And truthfully, and I kid you not, I'm sitting there with the, uh, you know, my cocktail napkin and I'm sketching ideas, and it seemed, ah, I think I got this. This is pretty easy. Stupid. <laughs> that was stupid. And if I knew now what I knew then, I would have still done it, but I would have, it, would, it was a lot more work. So here's the idea. Why don't I go to islands that have a lot of relief, in other words, mountains surrounding these little catchment basins, and simply look for not overwash, but the other thing that comes with most tropical cyclones, heavy rains. Pretty simple, basic sedimentology, geology. Rains, the butt load, hillsides erode. You bring that sediment down from the hillsides, and it deposits in the catchment basins around it. And lo and behold, you know, we saw it. I saw it in these little, here's one example. You see the gravels. Those are nice. The mineralogy is definitely coming from the surrounding hillsides, not from the marine source. And we had lots of these little lagoons or these little catchment basins. The C to N showed us that, in fact, it was terrestrial. And we were even able to walk a couple of kilometers up to the source of these sites, and you could see where it was actually coming from. Pretty simple story. See where it's coming from? Heavy rain, it deposits down, and there's this nice gravel. Well, talk about devil in the detail. I then realized, and I started to coin it, it really required a bunch of Goldilocks conditions for that simple story to work. So number one, and this was pretty straightforward and easy, is like I really wanted to go somewhere where it was somewhat representative of hurricanes in the North Atlantic. You know, the problem is if you go to one spot in Florida or one spot in Massachusetts, it really doesn't reflect what you see across the whole North Atlantic. And not that one location that I'm going to show you today does it, but I think some sites are better for that indication. And so here's one that we picked out. We looked at other sites, but I'm going to focus today on St. Croix, part of the U.S. Virgin Islands. You can see where it's located. This is the Herdeck track for the last hundred years. And what's great about the Eastern Caribbean in that particular zone is you can see a lot of storms pass through there. In fact, most of the storms that come across the Atlantic pass through this 
about a five degree latitudinal band before they then march up either to the east coast, north Atlantic, or down into the Gulf. Now that certainly misses those that form in the Gulf, but this does capture a lot of our traditional ones that come across the Atlantic. So, got a good site, and that Goldie Lock is sort of just right um, being in the Eastern Caribbean and in that hurricane pathway. I was also curious, well, all right, I see the tracks, but really what does this look like? Can I say anything about the North Atlantic and hurricanes in general by looking at, at this region? And here's just one example. If you look at the number of storms passing within 50 nautical miles, I said Antigua, the same applies virtually for St. Croix. Um, that's the blue line, so you see the number of storms since the 1850s. Again, this is from the HERDAT data set versus the number of storms in the Atlantic Basin, and you can see that region's only seen about 10%, but it follows, it tracks nicely. You can see the correlation score with uh, what we see across the whole at North Atlantic Basin. So I thought, okay, cool. If we know a lot about that region, then it, we can at least make some inferences about what the whole North Atlantic has seen. Here's the Goldilocks wish number two. You've got to have uh, an accreting little catchment basin. So here's the problem with coastal sediment, which was what I'm really out in the surf zone. It, you know, it has this aggravating habit of getting reworked with each passing storm. So whatever record gets deposited, at least in a sandy, more uh, sedimentary environment, it gets reworked. So I had to find out, I had to find these little coastal lagoons that actually persisted and were present and accreting through time. And luckily the Caribbean, at least some of the islands, we have a nice um, historic chart reference. So here's one from St. Croix from the early 1700s. Antigua has some back to the 1600s. Puerto Rico has similar um, uh, charts and some of these coastal ponds. And what was nice is that uh, we were seeing very, very, uh, we basically were seeing these persistent little catchment basins in the lee of uh, these uh, uh, surrounding highlands. And here's, here are the two um, ones that we actually focused on in St. Croix two little basins here, South, uh, Great Salt Pond and Southgate Pond. And you can see the surrounding topography in these very uh, narrow drainage basins from which it was um, uh, collecting. Well, the other, the other part is, of course, I had to, I had to, to make sure that um, we weren't just going to pick up every time there was a heavy rainstorm. And I'll, here's an example. This would not work, say, in the mountains of Puerto Rico. Why? Yeah, it happens all the time. You know, it's a rainforest, and the mountains are high enough in that island that it's going to generate the rainfall from, from uh, just from the orogenic effects. So, but they had to have enough relief, so this wouldn't work really well in the Bahamas. So again, the Goldilocks thing, it had to have high enough mountains to generate relief to, ca to cause erosion and catchment in the basin, but it also couldn't be too high. And in much of the area, this is actually a record from Antigua, <coughs> but we see a similar thing from St. Croix. You can see that over, say, this time period that we looked at. Here's our flooding threshold, so the rainfall in each particular basins. That most of the heavy rainstorms, passing rain, were in fact from passing tropical cyclones. So by catching, by measuring these heavy rainstorms and, and the resulting little gravel layer, we believe that reflected the passing tropical cyclones. So the cores. Hmm. We had two approaches. This was what we call our stealthy. This was really the low budget version. And I love this story because this was our Antiguan research vessel. Uh, it was a John, they charged me $500 a day for this thing. And it came with someone to help me row it. That's Michael there with the push pole and a bucket. And my job, it really ran by Michael pulling and me bailing because the rivets kept popping out. So we had to, we used our research vessel to hike in our our Vibracore, it was about a two mile hike to get into this area um, and that was the, the fruit of our labor there. Uh, here we got mean and, and that's where I wore my Corps of Engineers hat. We brought a big machine. No, actually that's a marine Vibracore that we tried on land and it worked pretty well. So once we felt like we had this idea down, we brought out the big boys and this is one of the, one of the sites. You can see the incoming little channel or the uh, yeah the, the flashy channel and we were coring in this in the headwaters basically of this catchment basin. <coughs> so what what we started to find well we did in fact you can see on this graph this is just going one core we see a very very similar story on our, on our several different basins that we looked at 
but you can see our gravel layers. There are little gravel spikes. And I, I know any of you guys that do sedimentology um, work, you know, well, okay, that's just really the start of the work is to have this. But I was at least intrigued and stoked to see preserved layers of these little gravel spikes. Uh, so, you know, there is something there. What does it mean? And then more importantly, you know, what, how far back does that or that? You know, taking depth and conveying that to age or time, that's really critical and also a much more difficult thing to do than what I realized, particularly in these environments. That's where Heidi Wadman, my co-author, really played a key role. Heidi started with the easy one, with just looking at the bomb spike, right? Mm -hmm. Is there still enough signal in the Northern Hemisphere? We can see a bomb spike um, around the 1960s. Um, but after that, it got complicated because these environments, I didn't have macro... Um, um, shells that I could date, They're fairly sterile environments. I did, that was kind of on purpose. I didn't want a lot of bioturbation. So it, unfortunately, I didn't have traditional things to date. And you couldn't just, can't just date the sediment because I'm just getting old dates from the surrounding hillsides. And that's where Heidi stepped up and applied um, a black carbon technique that I'll tell you a little bit about. So this was the easy stuff. Again, she looked at, um, she got where the, the cesium speak, the peak was, and we were able to come up with a rough accumulation, at least at the top of the core, based on where that spike was. We also did typical radioisotope decay rates, lead 210, and that proved to be very difficult, um, which I think is a very common thing in these types of sediments, um, in the coastal sediment. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't behave like a nice, fine-grained, deep-sea sediment core that shows that nice profile on decay. But anyway, it gave us somewhat similar, <coughs> similar rates. But of course, that just told us what was kind of near the surface. That was the easier part. But what about when you go down deeper? And is it really fair to extrapolate an accumulation rate from the very upper, say, 10% of a core down through the bottom of the core? I don't think so. I don't think this environment is necessarily, it is, it is non-episodic, so the accumulation rates are not linear. And even how we core, probably is not completely linear, in, so it compacts or, or not uh, d down the core. So Heidi turned to this black carbon, and it was new to us, though it turned to find out it was not that new to the archaeology community. I don't know if anyone around here uh, is, is familiar with that, but it's fairly commonly used um, in the archaeology community, and Heidi successfully used it at New Zealand on a source to sink funded project where we, we had a nice fire record, and that's really what it comes down to. There, there are two components of the black carbon. One of them is the coarse grain, and that's sort of the stuff that makes sense to me. You see literally pieces of char left in the, in the sediment from fires. The other one is a fine grain one, and that one actually shows you a nice peak in the 70s when diesel engines and diesel exhaust boomed around the earth. So when we lose our atomic cesium spike, we can all go to fine grain black carbon to see uh, more modern records. So Heidi found that, and what she also found, and this is maybe one of those Goldilocks things because it might not be uh, available everywhere, but Croy happened to have an amazing, interesting, fascinating fire record. Here's a table. I know you don't, won't read it, but one of the things that was neat is, look at this. Back in 1650s, the Knights of Malta settled in, in, in uh, St. Croix. And what's fascinating about that story is in their records, in their logs, they note they burned the island and they burned it so much and so quickly that they had to move on to their ships. They didn't leave enough space on the island. <laughs> it got so hot, I guess. Um, but there are other um, very well recorded uh, five or six uh, of these uh, island-wide, fairly devastating fires. And Heidi used that to essentially create the, the um, this record or this age model. So the Slave Revolt, Maltese Nice, and some of those others that are recorded. So we used the, what we knew about and had confidence at the top end and then combined that with this fire record and these spikes in black carbon that she counted very meticulously down the core at every half centimeters. That's again why she was co-author because you couldn't have held me to a desk long enough <laughs> to do that. So here's the other thing and I'm, I, I hope some of Thinking that, okay, you've got these gravel spikes. I know Julie, Julie asked me this earlier. You have these gravel spikes going down a core, and now you have an age model that you can apply an age. But, you know, what spike makes it a storm and just background? I mean, how do you know, how do you tell just a, a light tropical rainfall from a heavy downpour? 
And that's where we teamed up with a group, um, some colleagues at the, um, at the Detroit district who had some experience running a hydrology model, which is basically I asked them to take the rainfall record that we had about 20 years from those drainage basins in St. Croix and the sediment record that we had and model that and tell us how much sediment, gr gravel, comes down at a passing storm, passing hurricane. And it simply, or in a nice, for me, the two or three hurricanes we had during that time period that they looked at, it overwhelmed the system. The spike, we are able to basically know what a spike is. And so we took that, and that's what you can see on the left-hand column. Here's our downed core. Here's our percent gravel. And the little asterisks are those spike that exceed our modeled hurricane. So in other words, if a hurricane passes, how much of the gravel is it going to bring down from the background? And then here's the age model applied to that depth and the, the spikes of whether or not they, they uh, 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 surpass the threshold from which we believe that they were very heavy range from likely tropical storms. So that was a big, big effort. And I was ready to stop then, but then Heidi reminded me that, you know, as much as we hate doing this, we actually ought to see if this makes sense to what we know about the historical record. Are we really seeing storms? or not. And so she used the HERDET data, but she also added to it um, from a, excuse me, from a local, the local sources. And this was a lot of fun. I had no idea. Going to some of these islands like Antigua, St. Croix, we did this at Vieques as well, and looking through some of these archives. And let me tell you, there's not like a Library of Congress that records all this information. It was, you know, literally going through, finding these three ring binders and and, and looking at this information, but she did a wonderful job, and she added to the HERDET database and extended it back, you'll see in a second, back to the 1500s, which I thought was, was pretty remarkable. And that's what you see on this right-hand side. So here's now the same time period, that roughly 500 years, and what we call the historical storm record. So during that time period, this modern stuff from HERDAT, we have a lot of confidence in. As you go back, of course, we have less confidence, but it, is, it w was reported uh, having a storm hit the St. Croix area. And we had 56 storms, as you can see there. Here is our sediment record of spikes that we believe were storms, and you can see we're seeing about 43 storm spikes. So I thought, oh, that's cool. We're getting maybe as much as 75%. Now, some of those probably are not storms, hurricanes, and there may be some other heavy rainfalls. But interesting. And, and actually makes me think, well, we're on to something. Now, one of the things we did not do is notice the magnitude of this gravel was much, you know, it didn't, it wasn't like we had all nice ones. It wasn't binary ones or zeros. It varied. And my guess is that probably does suggest the intensity of the rainfall. Um, but there are a lot of other things. It might have been how much that drainage basin was grazed of the decade before that might influence it. So I just kept it to if you were a spike in excess of what the model said you were, then I counted you as one storm. The other limitation of this, we couldn't cut the core fine enough, really. Um, we cut it at, at a half centimeter intervals, which was, again, maddeningly you know, difficult. Um, and just doing the analysis on that was, was, was a challenge. But we really need to be able to look at it finer, uh, I think, to resolve it. So my guess is between the age model and our ability to cut this at three or half centimeter intervals, we're missing some. But by and large, it looks like in this particular location, this proxy seems to uh, uh, fairly accurately reflect passing tropical cyclones. So. This is what the two look together. Uh, one of the other challenges that I didn't expect and I ran into and others might be already familiar with this is, see these spikes? Man, these are not nice periodic stationary records that we normally do our harmonic analysis with. This was a challenge for me. I had to go back and I, you'll see what I, I played around with. But um, it was really hard to compare even, you know, these are not apples and apples here. It was hard to do a nice quantitative analysis of, of comparing both historical and storms, and then the other proxies that I'm talking about in just a second. And as I go back into the literature, Ilsa, I think you can speak to this and many others. You know, others that do this paleotempestology, I've seen it, you know, they'll get squiggly lines, and if the squiggly lines sort of match up generally with maybe ENSO 2,000 years ago, it's like, yeah, that might, if you squint at it, it's like interpreting seismic record. Maybe 
Maybe there's a relationship. So I was really struggling with, can we quantify this better? And though I, well, the great thing about this data set is now we were getting a high enough resolution over a long enough period that I think we were able to apply some of the, these more rigorous harmonic analysis tools. So one of the things that I settled on, I've done a lot of other, but I'm just going to show you this today, is taking those spikes of occurrence per year, okay, and then looking at it over, say, how many occur over a three-year or a seven-year, a 10-year, 20-year, essentially bar graphing it, right, bending it and seeing. And, and so what you're looking at is a seven-year uh, filter, running average, running smoothing average is over seven years of the historical record, which is in red, so you can see, notice here in the 15 and 1600s, Heidi's reconstructed, or it's not, I'm not going to use that term because I'll use it later, Heidi's historical documents suggested very few storms. What do you think that's from? Were there very few storms? Or nobody's around, right? And that's the problem. You know, this has been done in the Philippines where the Jesuits had a record of about 500 years. And that also showed a very sparse number of storms. And what's always begged the question on this analysis or this approach is, is it just because we didn't have enough people there to record it? Or was it really less? You know, sea surface temperature was cold. So the, uh, the black is our sediment, our re our, the sediment record, the number of storms. And you can see, oh, well, actually in this time period, we're seeing more storms that was than, than what was recorded. Um, and it is, I put significantly correlated, and I do that with a little bit of holding my nose. It is significantly correlated. They detrended or demean it, and it is cross correlation significant to 99%. But what does that really mean? I mean, does it really pass a test? My guess is yes. I think there's some consistent things here. Um, you know, I'll show it in, in this area where we see these, these time periods where it does appear to be much lower activity, you know, 10 to 20 year period in the, in the 50s up to the, about the 1990s, it appears to be much lower. This whole time period of the 1500s and the early 1600s seems to be much lower activity. And then there are these time periods that both the sediment and the historical documents suggest a lot of activities, the mid 1700s and much of the 1800s. The blue line is what I'm calling my reconstructed storm record, and that's what everyone seems to do in this area, is they take some of their proxies and they reconstruct the storm record. I only did it because I thought, well, you know, I really don't believe the historical record from this time period, but I believe the historical record more than the sediment record up here, and I also know that the sediment record can only be, you know, dated down to a, a few years. The limitations of that I won't go through again. So I basically just came up with a, an, a mean of those two signals to generate this light blue line, and I call it my reconstructed storm record. And the reason I did that was for this next step, which is the most exciting step and really why I got into this business seven or so years ago, but one in which I'm kind of out of gas, and I'm hoping you guys might have some thoughts on how to take this further. Because now that I have this reconstructed record at a resolution that's better than most and longer than most, now can we actually look to see how is it related to some of the classic climate proxies like ENSO? And that's what we did next. Oh, before we did that, was I asked the question, what I asked you guys earlier. The number of tropical cyclones according to our record, are they increasing or decreasing? And you can imagine what you'd say if, in this case, what I'm showing you, um, Maybe that's what I'm showing you, is if you use just the historical record, right? If we said that we didn't see hardly any storms because nobody was around for 200 years in the 15 and 1600s, which way do you think the trend is going to be? It's going to be increasing, right? Well, what, what happens, which is you can see the slope of this little red line here, certainly higher if we're just using the historical record. Um, the, the black line here shows you a lower slope if I'm using either the reconstructed one or the record a la our sediment. So it adds it, that, that in itself, I think, is an interesting finding that wh whichever way we look at it, we do see an increase. But I did think it was kind of fascinating also just that, boy, just using the written record could really get you in danger. And how do you get negative storms? It's, a, it's near the Bermuda Triangle <laughs> <laughs> um, because I demeaned it and it dropped it down. Now, I did, what also what Nathaniel's seen is 
a bit of the artifact of this forward and backward running filter. So I filter that. You're looking at the seven-year filter. I also looked at the actual spikes, Nathaniel, and did the same thing, and it showed a very similar number. Both approaches showed a, an increasing trend. So, okay, then I started, or let me, and this is the last piece, was, well, what are some of the classic um, uh, climate proxies uh, or climate, yeah, proxies that people have looked at? And INSO is one that probably gets the most attention, at least of late, in the literature. Um, this is what the, I plotted the record because I just wanted you guys to see if you're not already familiar with it. This is INSO reconstructed from the uh, same time period, 1475 on up. To, to present, and you know, my eye looks at this, and I'm like, oh crap, what? I don't see a signal there. That's a hard signal to extract much from, right? Again, this quasi-periodic um, um, variable. The the bottom panel is showing a, a, a wavelet um, power spectrum, and so you can see the same time period on the x-axis and the period on this y-axis and the, the warmer colors indicate higher power. And as you expect with INSO, you see a lot of power right around this five to ten year time period. Sometimes there's more, more power than other times, which I think is fairly fascinating. And I played around with this. I made periodograms of these wavelet periodograms, or excuse me, wavelet power spectrum from the sediment record, from the hurricane historical documents, from this. And, but I really struggled in a rigorous way to compare that. You know, I could, you can go and you can say, okay, well, look, ooh, that's interesting. That was a cool time period right around 1900. Do I see a similar time period in, from the sediment record or from the her reconstructed record? There is a bit of that, but I really struggled with how to do it. One thing that I did was I just extracted a line, say, at seven years. What was the power along the seven-year period through time? I did it that way, and I also did it a more classic way in that I just calculated the variance over a decade or over seven years, a running variance of this time period. Both of them show a similar record or similar result, um, and this is what we're seeing. So our blue line on the top panel is our reconstructed storm record for St. Croix for 500 years, um, and the purple line is our INSO variance, and again, Nathaniel, it's negative here because I demeaned it. Um, uh, but it too, even after demeaning it, it was significantly correlated. Not great, and you can see lots of exceptions where you know the two don't meet and don't line up. But an overall trend that makes you think, yeah, maybe there is a relationship. So I, you know I, that was again this sort of the fun part. This is the candy store time. And but I kind of just ran out of gas on different approaches. And again, I hope that some of you guys can can make have some thoughts. The bottom panel, I think, is maybe the most fascinating. The blue dotted line is what I'm calling the residual, which is simply the difference between our reconstructed storm record and INSO. So the idea is I could, I could take this data, and I did, and I made a little model, just a little equation. I fit um, the, this, these two lines together and basically create an equation. And it essentially said, if I know INSO, and people have forecast INSO, um, out to great time lengths and hindcasted it to great times, then I can predict the, the storms, which I did and made cool wiggly lines. But I didn't really believe it because there's so many times where, you know, look at the residual where it really just, here's a prime example, where it didn't line up whatsoever. So what am I doing other than just extracting, extrapolating INSO? So, so the blue dotted blue line is basically where it doesn't work. So when you see these peaks here and you see a big peak there, those are times where the two are completely, you know, the INSO is not predicting what we see in the sediment storm record. So I thought, okay, well, what about some of the other classic proxies? Or is there something else? One that, that uh, Dick Poor said today, I love it, he said, is one of the O's, NAO, AMO, you name it. There's several others that I'm forgetting right now. So I looked at both AMO, I did also looked at NEO, and I'm, and I'm not plotting, but I thought, well, if I take the residual of this, plot it to one of the other proxies and see a relationship, then I can create an equation. It's simple. The problem is, none of the damn proxies are lining up with that residual very well. So look at the green, or yeah, or well, here's AMO relative to the, to the residual there. Uh, not really related. 
Here's a prime one that everybody seems to like, sea surface temperature across the Caribbean. I love this time period. We're coming off the, uh, you know, that, that melt period where we have the cool waters up to about the mid early 1700s. But boy, there's really no relationship there that pops out to me at least. Um, uh, again, NAO also similarly. So all that to say, uh, it looks to me like it's not simple. And um, uh, I, was, I, I had a lot of hope, and I still do. I think this is interesting in a contribution, but there are lots of times where it doesn't work, and it's not obvious to me how to find the other two or three or six variables that might help us do a better job. So to conclude, we did have made progress, and I really am excited about it, but I also realize we have a lot more to go. But it does look like this, flood, this type of proxy can, in the right conditions, give us as much as 75% of, of the uh, cyclone record. I interesting, and I don't know the implications, but maybe meteorologists or climatologists can. The early 1700 and mid 19th centuries were very hot in terms of tropical cyclone activity, at least in the Eastern Caribbean and St. Croix region, whereas the late 17th and early 20th centuries, very few, very cool time period. And both the sediment record and the historical record suggest there as is in fact an increase in occurrence in hurricanes in that region over the past 500 years, which I think is significant. Um, and then the St. Croix record does suggest a relationship to ENSO, but not that strong. And I was really hoping that we might have a little more of a home run with that analysis and, and, and subsequent ones. But all that, I do want to conclude with this. And it's something I'm, I'm quite passionate about, and I'm really going to spend some energy I think what we need to do, what we owe as a coastal community to the meteorologist and to society is we need to build a long-term high-frequency cyclone record or hurricane record in both the Atlantic and the Pacific and one that is actually useful to meteorologists and modelers that can work on short-term and longer-term. And I think we could do it as a community with these different proxies. And again, as I pointed out in that one table, I can guarantee you the sediment record that we develop is not the end-all, beat-all. It does have some strengths, and I'm really excited about that, but it needs to be pieced with some of the other proxies that I think, and across spatially, not just the Eastern Caribbean, but a much broader area to help to get at that. And I, wanna, I had a whole host of characters over the years helping me. This is a short list, but the folks at um, the St. Croix and Antigua have been fantastic. So thank you very much. So you, lead you have to give me answers, by no, the way. No, no, no question. You lead us on with this great seven-year cycle. You say you see it at Duck. Yes. You say you see it in the Virgin Islands, and then you don't say anything else about it. What's the cause of it? Why do we have the seven-year cycle? I don't have a clue. Coincidence. I don't, I don't, I, I really don't have a clue. It's fascinating to me, though, that you can get, you know, that anemic-looking fluctuation in temperature from the Pacific, and we see, you know, such ramifications in storms, not only tropical cyclones, because duck is extra-tropical as well as tropical that's influencing that, and we still see that, so, so strong.